Good morning. Welcome to Amazing Grace Online. Glad you're here. Thanks for stopping in today. Well, today marks the third week of our series, Focus. And just to give you a little summary of where we've been in the last couple of weeks. Week number one, we looked at focusing on the good, the good things in life. There are certain things that the world cannot give us, things that can only come by way of the Holy Spirit. Paul calls us to be constantly thinking about these things rather than worldly, temp temporary things. The second week, we looked at focusing on Jesus, and we considered the story from Matthew's Gospel, where Peter and the other disciples were caught in a storm. They experienced numerous different emotional reactions, and ultimately, Peter stepped out of that boat, and he walked on the water to Jesus. We saw firsthand what happens when someone loses their focus on Christ and instead chooses to look at distractions around them. Today, we're going to look at focusing on our future. And our verse today is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. So grab your Bibles, open up to 29:11, Jeremiah, and we're going to read that. But let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to bless our time first. Our Father God, thank you for bringing us together. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is full of promises. We thank you for the hope that we have within the scriptures. We thank you that you are the God who keeps his promises. And we pray for today, Lord. We pray that uh, all of us who are gathered around and meditating on this word today, that, Lord, there would be breakthroughs, that there would be uh, a message of hope and encouragement today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we look at our passage, I want you to do something. If you have a piece of paper or if you've downloaded the Amazing Grace uh, bulletin, on the back of that bulletin, there, there are sermon notes that you can write. And we have on the space in the back of the bulletin uh, spaces you can write these. Uh, the, these things down, and I'll give you them in a moment. But if you have a piece of paper, I just want you to take a piece of paper, and Jeremiah 29, 11, we're going to summarize today three words that uh, summarize this passage. Okay, so we have Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay, so our first word is this one. It's perceive. So just write down perceive. Remember, I before E, except after C. The next one is receive, R-E-C-E-I-V-E. -E. And the third word today is achieve, A-C-H-E-I-V-E, -E. achieve. Okay, so here's what our passage says. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The summary of this text today is uh, this. Because of, of Israel's turning away from God in committing gross sins of, of idolatry and other sins, uh, God allowed the Israelites to be carried away into captivity for 70 years. This is known as the Babylonian captivity. Their oh, disobedience to God was like 490 years before judgment came. So God is very patient. God is, God is long-suffering. He's, he's giving people an opportunity to repent. But finally, their sins had caught up with them, and they were carried off into the Babylonian captivity. Well, as they sat discouraged in a hopeless and helpless situation in, uh, Israel, in Babylonia, rather, many of the Israelites felt that they had messed up so bad that they would never be in God's favor again. They thought that God was, was through with them. However, God sent a powerful word of encouragement through the prophet Jeremiah. This same encouragement that he gave the people of Israel so long ago is an encouraging word today. I want to encourage you that if you are sitting in a place right now where you are discouraged, where you are feeling hopeless, that you are feeling helpless, then I want you to tune in today. I want you to take uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Look at these three words, perceive, receive, and achieve. This is how we focus on our future. And so let's unpack this. We're going to give you the, the main points as we go. So uh, today we're going to consider three revelations from Jeremiah 29, 11 to help us focus on our future. All right? Question, are you sitting in a hopeless situation? Are you struggling because of a circumstance? or a situation you have found yourself in or that you can't control? Let's look at three things to consider about God, the God who holds our future in his hands, 
to help us to focus on the future. The first one is this, for I know the plans I have for you. This is how this word starts today. And here's what we need to perceive. God is thinking about you. That's our first one. God is thinking about you. Did you know that God has dreams for you? For I know the plans. No, God is thinking. K-N-O-W, not N-O, but K-N-O-W. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you. God is thinking about you. Did you know that the Hebrew word that is translated plans in Jeremiah 29, 11 is mahaka shabah, and it means imaginations. So it could read, I know the imaginations I have for you. Another word for imaginations are dreams. God's thoughts are toward us. Stop and think about this for a moment. The creator of the universe is thinking about you. All right, God's love is unending, unyielding, and uncompromising. And by the way, today is Valentine's Day. And God's love is unending, unyielding, and uncompromising. And we see this in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. For I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. You know, David realized the awesome, awesomeness of God's thoughts towards him. In Psalm chapter 40, verse 17, David said, Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. And then we jump over to Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And when I consider your, your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You see, God never forgets you. God never forgets any of us. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16 says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That verse almost speaks of God tattooing your name on God's palm of his hand. Have you ever needed to remember something and you didn't have a piece of paper? I remember doing this as a kid and having to write something down. And so I take a pen and you write on, the, on your, your hand so that you remember it. Or if you had to go to the store and, and get some groceries and you didn't have a piece of paper, well, where's the best place to keep it so you had it handy? On your hand. Look at this. God writes your name on his hand. He engraves our identity on his hand. So I want, you to, I want you to know this too. God knows your name. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But know this. This is what the Lord said. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Isn't that incredible? So perceive that God's thoughts are toward you. Friend, I want, you to, encourage, I want to encourage you in, in this one too is don't ever underestimate God's thoughts towards you. Don't underestimate God's thoughts, his dreams, his imaginations that he has for you. God has plans for you. And don't ever underestimate this important thing. There's an illustration I'd like to share with you that the Kansas City Star newspaper, they once fired a cartoonist in 1919. You know what their reason was? Because the editor of the Kansas Star felt that this cartoonist lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Who was the cartoonist? You know who he was? He was Mr. Creativity himself, Walt Disney. Years later, Walt Disney bought the Kansas Star. And just like the, and just like the editor didn't realize the, the depths of Disney's imagination, so we don't realize the, the depths of God's thoughts towards us. You are the object of God's dreams. Our second uh, point this morning, is uh, our next one is receive. Receive. And here's where... I want to share with you that God wants to bless you. Receive because God wants to bless you. Look at, our, look at in the passage, it says plans to prosper you and not to harm you. God wants to bless you. God is for us and not against us. I want you to stop and think about that the next time you're going through a tough time. Or maybe you're going through a tough time right now and you feel all alone. Here's a word for you. Romans 8.31 if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, because of their sinful mistakes, the Israelites feared that God had turned his back on them in disfavor. 
the fact is sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, God spoke through Jeremiah and he assured them that God is for them and not against them. This is because their hearts were turning back towards God. As they were sitting in their captivity, they're going, oh, is it too late? You see, their hearts were coming back. At what point does a heart change from the, the pathway of, hey, this ain't working anymore. We got to get back to God, you know? And they're sitting there thinking, oh, I made so many mistakes. This is not working. Lord, would you, would, you, would you help me out? And this is where they're calling on God. And how often have we done that? You see, they had God's promise of his blessing, his plans to prosper and not to harm. This is, this is a, a, something that is meant to receive. So they could have confidence that God is a God who keeps his promise. So we also have this confidence of God's promise. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turning from your sins and reaching out to God, you have peace with God. You have received his blessing. Romans 5, verses 10 and 11, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, we've been reconciled to God through Jesus God's presence is closer than you think, my friends. His presence is right there, even in difficult times. So we need to be in a position of perceiving that God is thinking about us and receiving what he has for us. Even the number of the, the hairs on our heads are, uh, are counted. The number of the hairs on the head is counted. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Look at Psalm 139, verses 2 to 4. This is how God is so close to us. You know when I sit and you know when I rise, you perceive my thoughts. Uh, you're not afar off. You discern my going out, and you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You see, even when we go through periods of uncertainty and difficulty, we can be assured. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 uh, and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of all those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. His purpose, why? Because God has plans. God has dreams for you. Verse 29, it goes on to say, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn, firstborn among many brothers. Friends, we need to focus on seeing how God sees. I read an interesting uh, description of how a seeing eye dog is trained. During the time of training, a seeing eye dog is taught to lift its vision to the level of his master's eyes. If it didn't look upward, it couldn't restrain its human master from walking into things up higher, like tree branches and so forth. Seeing eye dogs are trained to raise their vision up to what their master's level is, higher up. For us, we should aim to see things as God sees them. His higher vision has a better perspective over the difficulties of life, you know, than our earthbound vision. So we want to aim our vision and, and pray, Lord, let me see what you see. And this helps in, in difficult situations. Well, the Bible has many examples of people who struggled, struggled even with failure, but God always prevailed. And I want to encourage you that God prevails. He has a plan, and his plans never fail, all right? Look at the Israelites. They failed God, but God's plan for them prevailed. They still entered the promised land. Only it took 40 years extra because they sinned. They didn't trust God like they should have. And basically, God's plan prevailed. They were a little delayed, but God won out, didn't he? God is so awesome that he often uses our mistakes and our sins and our heartaches to take us to our destiny. Abraham tried to take things into his own hands. He tried to manipulate things in his favor, and Sarah helped him out in this. You see, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they were only getting older. They concocted this idea to help God out along the way, and they made nothing but hardship and trouble for all their efforts. 
when Ishmael came along, it caused heartache and, and so forth. But friends, I want to tell you something. God is faithful. Finally, Abraham and Sarah let God do the things in his way. They rested in his promise. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, it says, By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. God worked through failure. Isn't that awesome? And Abraham and Sarah. I love that description. Even though Abraham was as good as dead, God came through. He kept his promise. Friends, here's the big thing. God is God. We are not. We don't have to help God with plans. And, and so we just need to trust. We need to believe. I have another example for you. Joseph. Joseph the dreamer. You know, jo God gave uh, Joseph dreams. He dropped dreams into Joseph's heart. God had a destiny for Joseph. But it wasn't until years later, after many difficulties and hardships, that Joseph's purpose was fully accomplished. You know, these examples from the Bible, they teach us that destiny looks forward. I once heard this, and I think it was Chris Hogan of the Ramsey program. He said, the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. And so what does this mean? Well, where we're going is much better than where we've been. Don't focus on past failures, past mistakes, or anything else that we've done that we're like dealing with today. We need to forget it. Ask God, if we've sinned, ask God to forgive us of that sin and go on. Don't look at your mistakes. The third and final word this morning is the word achieve. Achieve. And here's where we come to this part of our, our passage, that God has plans to give you a hope and a future. God wants you to achieve because of his plan. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, the first thing that we're going to look at in this part is God molds us for his purpose. It's just like the illustration of the potter and the clay. I love watching a potter uh, work on a, uh, with a wheel and that lump of clay is out there. My wife ordered these special cups that were turned on a potter's wheel. And they're designed for cold Minnesota mornings because they don't have a regular handle on them, but they have a, a, a part that comes out where you can put your hand to grab the cup, but it warms up your hand as you're having a, a warm cup of coffee on a cold day. Well, that, that cup was in the mind of the one who made it. And so every potter begins with a dream, an idea. The pot exists in this, the potter's mind first. He starts to spin the wheel and shape the pot. But then he runs into a problem. There are too many imperfections in the clay, small pebbles. Sometimes he has to stop the wheel and dig out the pebble. He may uh, be able to keep going, but sometimes the gouge is deep, and he has to smash the clay and start over. Someone comes in and walks in in the middle of this process, and they say, man, that is one ugly pot. But the potter just smiles and says, I'm not done yet. The person who said that, that that's an ugly pot, just sees it at that moment. What it will be is what is dreamed. In Isaiah chapter 64, 8, it describes God as the potter. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. You see, God is the potter, and you and me, we are the clay. You and I are the clay. He sees not just what you are right now. He doesn't just see what, what I am right now, but he sees what we can be and will be if we trust him, if we take him at his word. He molds us into the image of Jesus day by day. We are God's workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Also, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed. You see, the potter's transforming us. And we're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God takes ordinary people 
and does extraordinary things through them. God sees beyond our ordinary. And God transforms us for his glory. God takes the broken, the beaten, and the battered, and he restores and creates masterpieces. This is because Jesus died on the cross for the broken, the battered, and the beaten. The cross, the cross of the past, gives hope for the future. In his book, and I have this book right here, I saw this book on my shelf in my office, and I have a collection of books, and I, I take them down once, and I page through them, and I start reading this, and it's like, man, this fits right in with the message today. But Tim LaHaye, in his book, The Power of the Cross, he writes of an experience in seeing and hearing one of God's masterpieces. He uh, writes that 1,200 people attended a special banquet in the grand ballroom of the Swan Hotel in Orlando, Florida. Everyone was dressed in their finest, ladies in long gowns and men in tuxedos. It was an unforgettable night as guests came from all over the state and many parts of the world to pay tribute to the cross of Jesus Christ. A highlight of the program was the introduction of a beautiful young soloist named Katrina. She was dressed in a floor-length white dress, shiny with sequins. She stepped into the spotlight as the house lights dimmed. All eyes were on her. Tim LaHaye says, I don't remember what she sang, but the performance was so beautiful, the audience gave her a standing ovation. When everyone was seated, this 23-year-old woman, whom every mother would be proud to call daughter, began to tell her story. She said, when I was 14 years old, I rebelled against my parents, ran away from home, became a drug addict, and had to sell my body in prostitution to get enough money to buy my next fix. Many in the audience gasped, for she stood there before looking every bit of the model of virtue and us and wholesome living. But she told how for two years she lived a literal hell on earth. Much like the prodigal son wallowing in the moral pig pen of the drop out drug craze culture of our day. After countless arrests, she was judged hopeless by juvenile authorities and was admitted to the House of Hope, a home for throwaway girls in Orlando, founded and directed by a lady by the name of Sarah Trollinger. The first thing Sarah was to give Katrina was love, a gift which Katrina found difficult in accepting. She did not love anyone, herself included. Then Sarah introduced Katrina to the love of God, in the person of Jesus Christ, who died for her sins on the cross and rose again. Katrina was particularly interested in the offer, not only for forgiveness for her sins, but also in the power to overcome her two-year nightmare of addiction and prostitution. She longed for the power to permanently live a new lifestyle. Katrina accepted Jesus Christ at the House of Hope and was carefully discipled by Sarah and her staff. For two years, she remained in the home where she learned to be a godly woman with a forgiven past, wiped clean of all guilt and shame. Tim LaHaye goes on to say, I will never forget, I will never forget how she stood re in regal innocence and beauty, an obvious witness to the power of the cross and God's amazing ability to transform the lives of those who invite him to save them. With a smile on her radiant face, Katrina said, Ladies and gentlemen, I have someone here I want you to meet. Suddenly another spotlight appeared at the other end of the ballroom where a handsome young man in a white tuxedo, he was standing there holding a little baby. And Katrina said, this is my husband and our six-month-old baby girl. She announced this to a chorus of sniffles. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. And there wasn't a... a a throat without a lump in them. The whole family joined on the platform. The crowd stood as one. Men and women wildly applauding their approval and praising God for this walking illustration of the power of the cross. Friend, there might be someone here right now who has lost hope for the future. Maybe you think that God can't do anything with your life. Maybe you're thinking, I'm too old or I'm too young. I'm not trained, prepared, or gifted. I'm not a leader or a visionary. Or maybe you're looking at your failures and you've concluded that you're just not good enough.
The problem is that you're looking at what you are, a half-finished lump of clay, and you're sitting on the wheel. The reality is that God sees the finished product, what you shall be. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, God is the dreamer for you. God has dreams for you. How many want to know God, what God's dream is? It's God's dream and desire for you to be born again. It's God's dream for you to work in his kingdom and to make a difference, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. It's God's dream to take the ordinary and do the extraordinary. Will you say yes to God's dreams for you? Will you make a deeper commitment to Jesus Christ than you've ever made before? Maybe you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've backslidden. You have forgotten about God in your life. And you're wondering why your life isn't going good. And you're wondering about your future, if you even have one. Friends, there's a future for you. And it needs to be realized. Remember, perceive God's thoughts are for you. Receive the blessing and achieve God's purpose. Would you pray this prayer with me? Let's ask the Lord. I'll pray this prayer and you pray along with me. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then join me in this prayer right now. Or if you want to recommit your life, if you want to recommit to have that future that God has for you, pray this prayer with me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I surrender my life to your call. Please forgive me for all my sin. I believe that you died on the cross and you paid the penalty of my sin. And I believe that you have risen from the dead and you are alive and well and you are the soon and coming king. Lord Jesus, come into my heart right now. And Lord, take my life and make me your spokesman and your disciple. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, one thing to be saved is one thing to be forgiven for all of our sin. That's incredible, isn't it? And that is just the most powerful thing. But you know what? One of the benefits of that is God's plan for our lives, the future. The future is bright when you and I walk in God's goodness, walk in his salvation, and understand that God's thoughts are for us and, and that we perceive that and then we receive that blessing, we can achieve his plan for us when we trust him. Well, friend, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've made a new commitment to him, would you please let me know? At the end of this video today, you will find a way that you can contact me here at Amazing Grace. Please send an email or call on the phone number given on the screen. But I want to encourage you, tell, tell, tell us here at Amazing Grace or tell somebody else, that you've made a commitment to follow Jesus. Well, friend, I pray that you have a wonderful day. God bless you. God loves you so much. He sent Jesus. You have a wonderful rest of the day and a wonderful rest of the week. We'll see you next time.